Gold Gold Club. Powered by Wolverhampton Building Supplies. With Mikey Burrows and Chris Ivalumo. Burrows alongside me, Chris Willemo. Our guest this week is a man who dedicated 13 years of his life to the club, coaching at almost every level. Delighted to welcome Terry Connor or TC. TC, as you're much better known. <laughs> yeah. um, there's so much that obviously we want to get into with you, and I know Looms has a lot he wants to say about your time as assistant manager because you kind of arrived into your respective roles at the same time. Yes. But before we get into that, I wanted to, you to take me right back to the start because I don't think a lot of people realise actually how long you were at the club and the roles that you did. So it was 1999. You do my homework. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I'm that sad, TC, that yeah. I will go through these things. That you the last first, <laughs> That you first came in. What was it about Wolves that drew you in and who drew you in? Uh, it was actually Colin Lee who was manager in 1999 with uh, my assistant was John Ward who had actually worked with at Bristol Rovers and Bristol City. Um, so we'd worked together for about five years, five, six years at, at both Bristol clubs. And John had moved on to assist uh, Colin Lee here. And um, in that summer, when Colin got the job, they were looking for a third coach, a development coach, to try and bring uh, the young talent, try and bring them through and get them, bridge that gap between youth football and first team football. And John recommended me for the for the challenge, so um, that's how I f that's how I arrived in '99. How d how did you find that? You know, with the the youth coaching the youth compared to like you say a, a pro player, like a top pro. Um, because you have to manage them differently, don't you? Uh, yes and no. Yes, yes and no. Right, yeah. Yes and no. Yeah, yes. Um, yeah, youth youth players you, you deal with totally differently, and you probably when you're coaching them, it, it's more about guiding them to you know to get to what you want so you want them to understand something so you're having to guide them so what do you think and how do you do that and why do you think I'm asking to do that and why and they come up with the answers and you can you can coach them and you take time to develop them uh, with senior players you want to do the same but you have to show that you are in charge of the whole group and you are trying to get the team to improve not necessarily just that one player you're getting the team to to try and and, uh, and be better so there's, it's the same because you want to give people knowledge, you want to give players yeah. the knowledge, but sometimes you, you are more in what I would say command type mode rather than like a discovery type, well, come on, let's, let's talk about this. It's sometimes, Chris, I just want you to do that because that's going to make the team better. And when, you, when you're dealing with the senior pros, I think they understand that if you're asked to do something, try and do it to the best of your ability. If you get to understand, that's even better. Because one of the things we thought about is that almost do you have to be a bit of a father figure? And does that then, did that then shape how you were as an assistant manager? Um, yeah, I think you're a father figure, whatever, where, yeah, wherever you're coaching and whoever you're coaching. Um, I mean, I look at it, it's almost like being a psychologist. You have to be so many different things when you're dealing with the players because every player <coughs> is different. And the, and the way that they learn, the way that they, you can speak to them, whether you approach them will be different. And it's trying to find the right tone, the right balance for each individual player before you can deal with the whole team. So I think uh, players start to understand you as a character <coughs> once you've dealt with that one player one-on-one -on -one, and then you put them into the squad and into the team. And when you talk to the team, he's going, oh, I know what he meant when he spoke to me individually. He wanted me to link in with this and link in with that. And I think that's when you get the understanding between the players and and the players understand the coach is better. The, the, but there's a, there's a big onus, well, probably not, on going out and, and winning games <coughs> as, as you're coaching young players. It's about them improving individually and collective. I don't I don't quite agree with that myself because I think you have okay. to have that winning mentality. But I'm just I'm, so I'm speaking as a player here. So I'm talking to you as a coach. When you go down, your, 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 your job is to basically improve these players, to see potential in them, to actually make it better, to make them better. But then you want them to go out and play these other games. Surely there the has to be a big onus on doing whatever it takes to win that game. As without, well, without without question, um, of course you're trying to develop players, and it, and there's a crossover where you're developing, and sometimes you put a session on, and and the players will say, "Well, I wouldn't do that normally in the game," and I would say, "Yeah, I know that," but in this training session, 
I want you to try and develop something. So when we take it into the game, you have to make that choice between whether you do it or not. So you're, you're trying to get them to, to understand what it takes to do something and then when to do it when they play in the, in the game. Yeah. So you give them everything and you say, well, would you use that? Would you do it there in the game? And they go, well, no, I wouldn't possibly. Well, would you do it in this part of the pitch then? Yes, I would. Yeah. Okay, well, that's when I want you to do it. And, and they start to understand what makes them win but you've developed their talents because you've asked them to do things in training which tries to make them better. Yeah, because you brought through uh, almost a, you know, I don't want to quite say golden generation, but there was some amazing talents. Yeah, and, and I think that's what uh, the club must have recognised. I think they they recognised that um, a lot of those players that they brought into the club uh, were good at youth level. And they, I think that year that I came, they won the Midlands Cup, they won something else with under league. They had three or four trophies. And my question was, well, what are they going to do with that? So I was saying to people like Jolien and Keith Andrews and, and those boys, OK, so you, you won some trophies. But what are you going to do? Are you going to have a career? What are you going to do with it? And it was my job when I came, I quickly realised that they had talented players here, but they needed to understand the bridge between winning things at youth level and doing things at youth level, which you'd never, you'd never get away with when you go into senior football. You never get away with it in the dressing room and you never get away with it out on the pitch. So it was trying to get them to understand that they've reached a good level, but the level they want to get to, you've got, you've got to do it. You've got to do a massive jump to get there. It's a lot of it about discipline. Because Loons has been telling me stories that you could go on the training ground. <laughs> the, smile, the smile says it all. <laughs> so, uh, big part. Big part. Discipline's a big part of it. And uh, doing things right. Doing things the right way, the right time. In training, because what you're doing, training, is, is generally what you transfer into games. So if you let them get away with things and they're late for work and they're late onto the training pitch, uh, you're doing something on the training pitch and they're sloppy with it, not doing it right, that's never going to work for anyone. So I, I, me as a coach, I always used to jump in, tell them that that's not what I'm looking for. That's not going to make us better. That's not going to make the individual better. And it's certainly not going to help the team get better. So when we're on the training pitch, we work like we would work on a Saturday. And that way, um, we, we managed to get results from, from the players. Okay. Sorry, you said a couple of names there. You know, uh, Keith Andrews, you know, Julian mm -hmm. Lescott, things like that. So you go in and you can see that the quality, they have the potential to go. So it is down to you that they realise very quickly that they have to do everything in their power. You set little incentives for them. And I think as a, as a coach, you have to do that. Yeah. But there's good players that don't have that mindset as well. That you, it, it can be difficult for you, like that ego yes. as well that you've got to handle. You've got to handle a lot of things. Yeah. And some some players you quickly realise. Um, there were lots of other players. I mean, those two were the those two were the star ones, if you like, or the ones that I thought those two definitely got something about them, which would take them uh, further in in the game. But there were others um, that played maybe at League One, League Two, uh, top of the uh, conference at the time when I had them here. But it was my job to develop them to play at those. I said, not all of you can play for Wolves in the first team. Not all of you are going to get through. Yeah. But you can certainly be as good as you can be. So if it's Championship or League One or League Two, you should make the most of that because it's a fantastic career to have. So it wasn't necessarily just Keith and, and uh, Jolien that came through. There were lots of others that played and had careers. And I still speak to them now. I still text them now. And they're playing around the lower leagues or now working and coaching and said those lessons that you gave us way back then stand them in good stead because they had a career they had a career in football and now they're going on and saying the same things that I was saying and they're saying to young players now yeah. um should say by the way for <laughs> those who are listening to the podcast the noise you can hear in the background is the rain that is absolutely <laughs> pouring down at Molyneux those who are watching on Facebook can see it to us in the background I mean welcome back to so yes <laughs> this, is, this was it um, one of the things, because I've been talking to, you know, I talked to a lot of the people that, you know, were in that kind of age groups that you helped bring through. And one story that one person told me, said that even, see, uh, he's smiling already. <laughs> um, even in the gym that you would say to players, like, don't do 10 reps of something, do 12. Because everybody does 10. So if you do 10, you're the same as everyone. If you do more, you're better. Is that... That was your it mindset. Was that type, yeah, it was that type of mentality. Yeah, I used it when I was a when I was a young kid growing up, and that that 
if someone did 10 if I could do a little bit more then that should make me better it's a simple mindset to have um, but what I would say well, in the gym sometimes when it gets tough and you have to do 10 reps some players will do 8 and then say I can't do any more that's, that's me done so what I was trying to say to them was if, if you can do more than what the task is you, you'll always improve you'll always get better and, and that's what I try to, to instill in them was that never leave yourself short never do 8 or 9 and think that'll do get to 10 and if you can do 10 and do 11 and 12 do it do it because that will be your advantage over the the, the, the the teammate next to you so when I said 10 yeah most of them would try and do 12 and if I said be there at 10 they would try and get there at 5 2 and start doing something uh, before the actual session started because they, they knew that it was giving them or they thought it was giving them that, that little bit more than the others and it's that kind of mentality that drives people forwards isn't it no of course you know I think uh if, if we can get away with something, we, we always will. Yeah. So I think, if, like you say, if a, a coach or the manager can see that and they they don't allow you to do it, you know, we've, we've all got it in the bank to carry on and do that extra one. But we never we never want to. You know, if we go out and do the, 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 mm -hmm. the finishing practice after training, a couple of shots in, but you should be out there. You know, and like you say, TC, then, and to be fair, I've had a, a few good coaches through the years that never allowed you to go in. Because like if I'm on if I'm on a good vein of form, you get a couple of goals. You just want to go in and and, and, and but there's there is players that have that in them that they're out there till like Carl Henry. Yeah, yeah. You had to tell him to come in. Come in, yeah. You had to tell yeah. him every day to come in. That's enough. Because that was just he just loved being out yeah. there, you know. Yeah. And it's just one of his. Come on, Carl. Let's go. Let's get, get in now. But it was <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that was that was same with you know other people like Matt Jarvis who um, yeah. who came from Gillingham and uh, you know played and played here and he actually went on and got an England cap. Same, yeah, like a bit yeah. like you got Scottish cap yeah. and stuff and that. Just just by doing them extra bits, yeah. by doing his finishing his crossing off, and even when he was playing well, you know, I'd say to him, "Where are you going?" And oh, I'm going. <laughs> come <laughs> on, yeah, come on. Yeah. We've got 10, 15 minutes that we can do this, and we would just do another set, another set, another set until um, you know, until you made him. He felt he was getting better and better. He could cross off his right. He could go on his left and cross. So it made it easier for the, for the boys in the middle to know that he could he could deliver that ball where he wanted. But it wasn't by luck. It was by working out on the training pitch that he did it. So after nearly a decade of bringing through young talents and helping to bridge that gap to the first team, Mick arrives. And Mick had been there, I think, a year before. Yes, he'd been there with Ian Evans, was his, was his assistant when they came from Sunderland, yeah. And so at what point does Mick say to you, Come on, TC. Come and be my right hand man. Uh, it was actually uh, Ian had um, he'd been away with Mick, and he'd always been his assistant since I think it was I think it's ninety two. So they'd worked together and they'd played together for a long time. Played up at Barnsley and Millwall and stuff. So um, they knew each other pretty well, and they'd done a lot of work together. And I think Ian was just wanting to be nearer home and be home a little bit more than than what them um, obviously working full time, in particularly in Wolverhampton, could do. So um, he said that he would like to take a back seat and maybe do a little bit more uh, scouting work than actual uh, being on the training pitch. And uh, at that time, I'd worked with Mick for a year as the, like, the third coach, you know, doing doing what I what I did. And obviously, he'd been watching that. And uh, he just he just came, called me in one day. And you know when you think, oh, what have I done now? I've done something. <laughs> I've done something wrong. And he's not happy. Gaffer's not going to be happy with me. And he just called me and told me to sit down. He said, look, Taff's uh, leaving. He's going he's gonna to do a different role for me. Um, and I'd like you to, to take over as assistant manager. And that was the first time in my career at, uh, at Wolves that someone had actually recognised the job that I'd done, or I felt they'd rewarded me for the job that I'd done. Um, when we got promoted in 2003, I was actually Dave Jones' right-hand man because John had had a hip operation. Uh, John Ward had a hip op operation, and... Um, I never really felt that I got the recognition that I deserved for that promotion. Not in terms of what I did, but I was never actually given the role or the title, yeah. although I'd actually done the, the role. So I think Mick had seen all that and sort of understood all that and felt I was probably ready to, to be you know, a proper assistant and he gave me the title and in many ways gave me the authority to change from being the development coach into a full-blooded, no, you are dealing with first-team players, that's all you deal with. You are my right hand man. That's what you're going. That's the job that you. I want you to fulfil. And he was the first person to really say that to me, and give me the title to go with that. 
so after so after that experience uh, in 2003 you're, you're ready for it you you loved every minute of it you want to get back in was that a little bit disheartening then was that was that hard uh, yeah. then for that what four and a half years to no because things i, I always i'm great believe things happen for a reason so you, you do them extra two burpees or the extra two yeah. uh, bits in the gym and you do the extra run and you reach the line for a reason and it might never it might not manifest itself just because you did it that time that it's gonna you're gonna get the reward for it in the very next game so yeah, but it brought success didn't it you, yeah, you it came did. in you, you, you've done, you done your job yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah, you yeah. took the mantle and uh, yeah and but that's it it wasn't my that wasn't my decision you see what I mean that would that would be down to the manager at the time and uh, I worked under Colin as a development coach mm -hmm. I worked under Dave in a different role and we got success and, and got to the Premier League um, under under Glenn I did a different role again so all I'm all I'm saying is that I did different things which made me ready but it didn't mean that I was going to get uh, the rewards just because I did those extra bits at that time so if it's taken for till 2007 for Mick to give me an opportunity and give me the chance to be the assistant manager then that's all that's that previous work that's what it was for yeah you know if I'd stopped and thought well I I didn't I didn't get it so that's me I'm I won't do it I won't do the extra bits I won't take the players I won't do which, it which you could which you could easily do yeah, but yeah. that's not me that's doing the extra bits yeah and it happens for a reason if you stop it will never happen mm -hmm. if you continue to do the, the best that well, you exactly. can do eventually something drops for you and so it was a, it took Mick I think to do that for me at, at Wolves so obviously Mick McCarthy come in in for a year how much dialogue was there between you and that period because obviously it's it's we, we spoke about it earlier about the relationship between staff assistant manager relationship between players how was that relationship when you sat in front of him thinking oh, what have I done now and oh, he said yeah, yeah. so there must have been a relationship there because I know yeah. Mick anyway he, he, the guy that he talks to yeah. everyone doesn't yeah. he he's open we and honest a, we had a great we had a great the three of us did the did the work did the coaching um, there, there wasn't a, a massive squad of players so mm -hmm. a lot of the development group was used with the first team with Mick and and Taff anyway so we were always together and, and the gaffer would say well could you do that bit of the session I'll do this bit and you can finish off with this and that so we were all working uh, together and I think that's when he probably saw at first hand the value of the work that I was doing with the younger players and he trusted people to to come into the team at, at that point there were players who got their debuts uh, you know Wayne Hennessy they all, all them boys came through yeah. and the gaffer trusted and put them in the team uh, when he thought they w it was right and it's for the work that we all did together so um when i say you know what i've done wrong or whatever <laughs> it was more like oh, no, what, why, why, yeah, why the gaffer called me in the office i don't yeah. want to be in the office sort of thing um but he just came in and said look tough tough you know going to be doing something different for me i've seen you work and there's no other, there's nobody else i want to work alongside than you so and that's what he said you know i'm giving you the title i'm giving you the role that's what i want you to do you can almost forget everything else you will be working solely with the first team and solely uh, trying to make the team uh, better alongside him. At what point then in that year, so you've started working together, and of course, because you got off to an absolute flyer that yeah. season, a lot of it thanks to the yeah. man to my right scoring yeah. some good goals, some bad ones as well, but that's another story. No, um, no, no, no such thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's no such scored a bad goal. <laughs> <laughs> at, what point, at what point did you think, well, this is working, <coughs> we, we could be on for something here? Uh, not really. I just I just got my head down. To be honest, I just got my head down and wanted to prove to everybody that I could do the job that Mick wanted me to do. So um, I was just so focused on, on making sure uh, whatever uh, duties I were asked to carry out uh, with the players and what sessions I were meant to do. And if I had to speak to players, you know, I would I'd be figuring out how to approach them, how to speak to them, when do I do it? Straight after training, do I have to call them back? Shall I do it in the office? Shall I just walk around the the perimeter of the pitch with them? So I just fully focused on can I do my job, and if I do my job well, knowing Mick and get to know the players as I as I did, I thought we'd have a chance to do something at least make the team successful. You're not a, you're not a yes man. So, so, so when you come in, uh, Mick McCarthy is also a very strong character. He has his beliefs on how he wants to play football, but so are you you you've been around Absolutely, the game yeah. long. So do, do do they have to fit? You know, like when you sit and like, let's talk football. I think, uh, yeah, the, I think the principle has to fit, Chris, you know. Yeah. Um, you have to think along similar lines in how you, you want the team to play and what type of characters that you want around you and, and around the team. 
and on that I think we're pretty similar in terms of we we're both born in Yorkshire we've both got good Yorkshire value sort of thing yeah. um you know gaffer's silver haired six foot two I'm black five foot seven yeah but we thought very similar about the ideas that we wanted where we differ is how we deliver that to players to the staff and what have you so if mix the manager he'll do it his way and it was it's my duty then to figure out how I can complement that and I think my style the way that I did things complemented what the gaffer did so it was always the same message I don't think any of the players or any of the staff could think that we were giving no, uh, different not. messages but it came from it came in a different way so the philosophy the the you know the, the way that the things that we stood for are very similar but how we got them across and how we dealt with people are, are two totally different ways of doing it we're going to talk a lot about the promotion because you're both going to have some really interesting memories about that year and about the early Premier League years as well. But just while we're on our Facebook show, we obviously have to talk about you becoming manager and almost that period that led up to it. What was going through your mind? Because things weren't going great for the team that season. Did you have an inkling that it was coming to the end for me? Uh, not, not at all, really. Not at all. Um Things weren't going well, but uh, I remember when we got promoted, I think we won something like 27 games, I think it was, drew eight and lost eight or something like that, some, some, some stats like that. So we'd gone from winning 27 games in the championship to get promoted to actually the following year staying up and everyone, I remember the fans coming on the pitch and uh, at the end of the season when we, when we retained our status in the Premier League. And I think that season we'd won eight or nine and that represented success. And because it came on the back of the promotion, everyone recognised it as success. Um, moving on, you're trying now to have the financial backing, uh, choosing the right players to, to take you from that level to mid-table in the Premier League and then maybe challenging for top six, top seven uh, later on down, down the line. But we probably got stuck a little bit always in that bottom six. So I think we finished fifth bottom and then fourth bottom and... So we we didn't actually make the strides that we wanted to make as a club. But the fact that we were still in the Premier League, and I think when Mick left in February, mm. I think when he left, we were not in the bottom three. But it shows how hard it is to stay in, in the Premier League. And uh, we <coughs> were, you can't say we were doing fantastic in terms of results and the way we were playing, but we still had an opportunity to stay in the Premier League for another season and, and if you ask people with hindsight now would you have taken that they probably would say yes we would, would have taken one more so when Mick goes did you want the job did Not you think so. you were going to get it um, I could think I can say it now because it's about six years gone by so um, but I actually my, my 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 desk was cleared at the same time as Mick uh, my black bag was done and I was out there with, with Mick um, but they, the club didn't have a successor so um, they asked me to look after it for two days would I just stay for two more days and that two days turned into a week and then that week turned into two weeks I think it was an international break so there was actually two weeks for the next game um, that turned into will you prepare the team for I think it was Newcastle mm. uh, and, and I think on that Thursday or that Friday morning they just said you know would you take the team would you would you take it? Would you do it? Um, so, at the time of Mick leaving, I was I was due to leave as well. So there was no thoughts about getting the job. I was due to leave. So how difficult was that? So I'm surely you spoke to the the gaffer uh, Mick McCarthy every day. Yeah. yeah. In that position, okay, I'm I'm taking it over to because you know the he respect knew, you, yeah. the respect you've got for him. That, yeah. that must be quite a difficult yeah. thing that you've now taken the taken yeah. the reins. Uh, that was that was later on, but at the time he knew and I knew that we'd both been relieved of our duties, yep. and I was only staying just to make sure there was a handover, official handover to a new manager. Uh, when that didn't take place, it became, oh, can you stay for a bit longer? And Gaffer, I've got to stay for another week. And I, oh, so you told him you spoke to him? Oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But kept him informed every bit, and even to, even when they asked me to do it to the end of the season, the first person I called was was Mick just to make sure that he was okay with everything and he he knew never, he knew in the build up to it he knew what had happened 
from the day that he got sacked. So he knew that um, it wasn't a case of ever me wanting the job or, or canvassing no. for the job. It was a matter of having to do something at, at the club until I was told to leave, really. One of the things that so many people have wanted us to ask you was kind of, do you regret taking it? No, not at all. No, it made me, uh, certainly, I think it made me a better uh, assistant when we worked at Ipswich. Uh, I understood more the, the stuff that uh, managers have to do, which they don't really, they, they don't really have, they don't really get a chance to uh, explain or, or they have to keep that within themselves. I was exposed to that and um, and I think I made better and informed decisions in the last so like six years because of that uh, Can you experience. tell us some of those little things? Just like things, that, you know, d uh, d managing upwards, you know, they call it when yeah. you go on your courses and they say managing upwards, you've got to deal with chief execs, you've got to deal with chairman, you, you might have to do a board meeting and all those things which I never got privy to. I was just coming out, oh, Gaffer, what, you know, can we buy him? Can we do that? I've seen him out. And <laughs> yeah. on, I, I, yeah. I fancy him and he, he's better and all those things that I was, you know, he was saying, you can't do that, we can't do that, we're not going to be able to do that. And I was going, oh, but Gaffer, we could do so much. All those things that he handled that never let it affect his work and our relationship, um, I was then exposed to. So I was asked, which player would you would you buy or which player would you sell? And all those things that a manager has to go through uh, to do his job daily is so, so much more than just going out on the pitch and dealing with the players on a, a between half ten and you know two o'clock or whatever and then players go home and you do you, you go home as well it, it's, it's not like that at all you, you know you have to you have to understand that there's a uh, chairman that uh, wants to understand what go what's going on chief exec will come in you with figures and you know you've got this squad you uh, what you're doing about balancing things like that uh, medical people come in you know tell you their input on players and stuff so there's lots of things commercial people want to pick pieces so there's lots of things media want to talk to you and you know they want to what what do you think of things and stuff and all that. I never did any of that. Suddenly you you have to do it and you have to step up and do it. So from that point of view, it was a fantastic experience. Yeah. Um, I tried my level level best uh, to put things right um, inside the dressing room and and uh, with the team and, and try and get them to 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 do it. But I think by that point, um, it, you know, if if Mick and I couldn't do it, I think it was almost impossible to ask me to do it on my own expect to um, to, to be successful so that's, that's what I was going to ask I think it's so important that a, a manager and a assistant and his staff like they protect the players from the above absolutely but then all of a sudden you're thrown into that so that, that obviously that must have made it very difficult to actually do do your do your job yeah. with the players properly yeah, because uh, you're juggling so much you're taking it all on yourself not so then, much aren't doing you? it, but like you know we, we talked about about uh, they call you TC or what do they call you I was cool with them calling me TC because mm -hmm. I was a caretaker manager so whether I stayed after the, my stint or not um, why would I want them to start, suddenly start saying well you know, call me boss and call me this and yep. call me the gaffer and if you don't call me the gaffer and oh, that's, that's not going to work I'd worked with those players for you know three four five seasons um, and uh, I just felt it was best to try and be myself for them so when we went on the training pitch I tried to be exactly the same or I was exactly the same person that I was when Mick was here, and then when I finished and they'd gone home, that's when I'd, I'd have to then put the other hat on and then try and deal with lots of other things. And, and things do change because, you know, players, I know the players came to me and when you left them out, which I'd never done before because I was always the assistant, um, when I left players out of the team and they're starting 11 and they come to me and they say, well, why am I not playing? I need to play. I've got the European Championship to look forward to or whatever yep. with my international. And they say, I want to play. Um, so I used to turn around and say to them, okay, so you want to play in the team because you've got this and that agenda. I just want to play and win. Don't you just want to play and win? So I, I, was, I was saying to them, it's okay you talking about things that you want to do. Uh, we need rules to win. Yeah. So don't tell me about international. Don't tell me about your personal thing. What will you do to help the club win some matches and stay in, in the division? So that was always my comeback. But I had to learn all that. Yeah. On the, almost on the on the on the job, but having had Mick as a manager, it stood me in good stead. We're going to talk a lot more about that on our podcast <laughs> extra, um, and also kind of what happened after that season and moving forwards as well. And we've got some special messages 
for you from some of your former players as well to come on the old gold club uh, but for now that's it for our facebook show make sure to download the old gold club podcast it'll be available at all the usual places the old gold club powered by wolverhampton building supplies with mikey burrows and chris Ivalumo.